what's happening with FCC, um, as he always does. We're very thankful for that. Kathleen could not come this time, but we are thankful. We are just thankful for the legal team. Um, I mean, for the most part, most of the Calvary's use your firm. So we're just thankful for that and that they take time each year to come to our small group and bless us. Um, so uh, there have been questions that we had on the list server. Um, so that's what you're going to address as well. And then afterwards, Matt, well, you know this. Any, it, it'll be a wide questions? open question. So let's pray. And uh, Pat's handing out some stuff as well. Uh, the handouts for you. Father, thank you again for this day. We thank you for Matt, Lord, and uh, his firm, and we just ask that you just bless them and that you'd bless our time, Lord, and that you would receive the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I love coming to this conference, uh, the places it's spread out. Normally, my uh, my cohort uh, or my, my colleague, uh, Kathleen Victory, would be with me, but Kathleen's... Uh, husband had surgery on Friday and it didn't go quite uh, like they were expecting. He's a little, it was a little more invasive than they thought, so she can't make it. She apologizes. She'll be here uh, at the Calvary Cal uh, Chapel Conference next year, I guarantee. Well, I can't guarantee anything, but, but that's, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're going to talk about a whole b array of things that, we've, uh, that I've received on the listserv, and anything else that you want to talk about that might have uh, legal implications, if I don't know the answer, I will tell you I don't know the answer, rather than just making things up. Um, just to introduce, I, I'm Matt McCormick from Fletcher, Heald, and Hildreth. Uh, like I say, my, my colleague is uh, Kathleen Victory, working with me at the firm on, you, know, you may run into at various times, or Cora, uh, Kristen Cora. She's a, a relatively uh, young associate with us. Uh, also, Sarah Hinkle, uh, Jackie Fisher, Seth Williams, any of those names you may see, or some of my other uh, partners. If a question comes up, don't hesitate to call. We're happy to talk. It's never a bother. And we're, uh, we'll be happy to, to, to answer whatever questions that we can. The first topic for today, because it's the most pressing one, that we're, it's, it's, the, it's the pressing uh, deadline that we're going to see in the next little bit, is the, the filing window for new non-commercial educational FM stations. The filing window, this is the first window we've had for a long time. I'm, uh, I, I want to say more than 10 years. Um, and it's open between November 2nd and November 9th. But you can't wait till November 2nd to get started. You need to get started on it right away. If you are thinking about filing for a brand new FM station, full power station, um, you, 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 you can do it. It's been, uh, people have been waiting for this opportunity for quite a while. The application will have to be filed in what's called LMS. It is the relatively new filing system that the FCC uses. Uh, we can't file it in, in CDBS. Uh, you have to file it in the new system. The new system is a little daunting, but uh, is, is manageable. I will say that if you're going to pursue one of these new stations, you want to get an engineer and you want to get a lawyer because there's many traps for the unwary in the, uh, in the process. Uh, there's a lot of information that you have to gather. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's things that you have to nail down. There's pledges that you have to make if you want to have a go for certain comparative points. Uh, there's, uh, th there's just a lot to do. And the number one thing that you have to do, if you're going to, well, first you have to decide if you're going to go for one. And then if you're going to go for one, you need to get your engineer lined up. And the engineer is going to help you find the places where a station can fit. Now, these stations will all be in the reserve band. That's between 88.1 and 90.9. Uh, .9. uh there, there's, there's also a limited number of reserved channels outside of the reserve band, but they're, they're very few in number, and uh, I, I, doubt, I doubt you would run across them. <coughs> When you have the, um, 
when you've decided to go and you've lined up your engineer, the engineer will look at the area that you want to put a station into and determine uh, whether a, a channel is open or maybe multiple channels that are open. And if a channel is open, at what power the channel could operate. The, it's, it's, uh, it's, when we're dealing with the uh, re reserved band, uh, we're talking about what's called a demand system. We, we try and fit, you have to fit your station into the general environment that's already there. Uh, it, it, that's in contrast to what happens on the commercial side, on the unreserved side between 92.1 to 1079. That is done by allotments. And the FCC ahead of time drops in and says, we're going to have an allotment in Old Bridge, New Jersey. Wouldn't you wish? It's not going to happen. Um, that they, they say it's going to be there. They've already determined that a station can fit there. And you, when there's a filing window, you file for it and you participate in an auction. By the way, there is no auction in this. No one's going to have to pay anything. Well, they're going to have to pay lawyers and engineers, but they're not going to have to pay the FCC for any of these stations. So the uh, process is that you, uh, you identify a location. You have to identify a specific uh, piece of ground or tower that you're going to put this uh, station on. You have to get the name. You have to get reasonable assurance of that tower. This is a relatively new item uh, on the FCC application form. We have to identify exactly from whom you got permission to put your transmitter, antenna, tower in a particular location, including the name, the phone number, and what position that person has with the tower owner. Either it is the tower owner, it's an agent, it's something like that. And you have to have that information and fully expect that uh, someone will check. Either your competitors, if you wind up, your, your application winds up in conflict with another application, or the FCC itself. Because the question of reasonable assurance of a tower site has been something that's plagued the FCC for 40 years. I, I practically put children through college litigating over the availability of uh, tri and whether someone had uh, reasonable assurance of, uh, of their transmitter site. And to address that, that's why they put it into the application form. Another requirement, but it's not in the application form, is that you have sufficient financial resources to build the station and operate it for three months without revenue. So that is, you're, you're certifying that that's the case. They're not requiring you, however, to prove that you have that money. Uh, but, that, but you are making it in the certification. So you've, you've decided to go for it. You've gotten an engineer. The engineer tells you what channels are available, what power is available. There's a lot of, of uh, I won't say gamesmanship, but there's a lot of things that you might choose uh, to do uh, at that stage. Maybe you go as big as you possibly can. Uh, maybe you go as small as you possibly can to try and avoid conflicts. It's, it's a tactical decision that has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis in consultation with your uh, engineer and your attorney. So um, then you've chosen, you've chosen where you're going to start. You start putting together the application. Applications are, it, it, for this group, you guys are all going to be, if you've already got your organization, you already have your church, it's not going to be a problem. You have to be a non-profit entity. Individuals cannot apply. For-profit entities cannot apply. They need to be a, non, a, non a recognized nonprofit entity. If you don't have a corporation or an LLC, you should think about using a corporation or LLC. There may, be, there may be offsetting factors about that that I'll go into in just a moment, but you should be thinking about whether, whether you want to, uh, uh, that the organization that you want to use. So it's not restricted to uh, uh, organizations that have been to apply. Uh, it's not restricted to organizations that have been in existence in a long time. It could be an organization that's just newly formed. That organization may be at a comparative disadvantage if it runs into a competitor, but it's, it's possible for them to do. It is much more advantageous, as I'll explain, 
uh, if the organization has been in existence for at least two years and is in this, uh, it is either located, has a campus, or 75% of its board members reside in the vicinity of the community that's uh, specified in the application. So anyway, so we're going on, uh, I'll mention, unless somebody's going really big, there is a limitation that an organization uh, can, or no individual can have an interest in more than 10 applications uh, that are filed during the window. Uh, the commission did that uh, because uh, when they opened a FM translator window a number of years ago, uh, there were certain organizations that literally applied for thousands of translators, and the commission did not want to have that situation again, where one organization applied for hundreds or of stations. So there's a limitation of 10, uh, 10, per, uh, 10 applications. Uh, for any individual. And so let me mention that. So if, if someone's on board A and that, then that organization files two applications and also is on a member of board B that files 10 applications, well, two of those applications are going to get dismissed because that person has interests in both boards. So uh, if, if anybody's got a, a, thinking about a, a filing that many applications, you know, talk to me and we can discuss uh, what the ins and outs of that are. So we put together the application. You try to put together what you think is the most advantageous engineering proposal you can because when, when we start, the commission's going to take all these applications in when the window closes on November 9th and they're going to start doing engineering analysis of it. And they'll look out and they'll say, uh, see which applications are not in conflict with any other application and which applications are in conflict with other applications. Uh, the ones that are not in conflict, they go merrily along their way. The FCC uh, looks at the engineering in further detail. If there's any uh, uh, deficiencies that they note, they will just contact the applicant or the applicant's lawyer or engineer and say, you need to fill in something else. You know, uh, and we provide it, we provide an amendment, it goes on, it gets processed, it gets granted, you get a construction permit, you have three years to build. Could not be simpler if you don't have, well, actually it could be simpler, but um, it, 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 it'll be a smooth process if you don't run into any conflicting application. Now bear in mind, this, this window is gonna be open for both religious organizations like Calvary Chapel, uh, religious organizations like uh, the, the Catholic organizations that are going to be out there and probably going to be filing, and of course all the non-profit secular organizations, whether that's the the state, uh, you know, the state NPR grouping or or uh, independent grouping or or whoever might be interested in putting on a non-commercial educational radio station. So there could be a lot of people out there that we don't know about that may be filing these applications. Okay, but so I mentioned that it's an easy path if you don't have a conflicting application that's filed, and you can't control that. If you do have a conflicting application, then, it's, then it gets complicated because we have to analyze where the conflict is. And, uh, and then the FCC will look at uh, which application is going to be um, going to prevail. Uh, they will be, I'm pretty certain, although they, they haven't specifically announced this, we anticipate that after the, the, uh, the conflicts are announced, they're called MX. You know, you'll hear that when you're talking to your lawyers or engineer, they talk about being MX, meaning mutually exclusive, means that both proposals can't be granted. And the MX, let's make this more complicated, the MX can be in a daisy chain, as it's called, where a is in conflict with B, who's in conflict with C, who's in conflict with D. Now, A and D might not be in conflict at all, but they're part of the same MX group, and only if, if there's not a settlement, only one of those will survive. Even though, let's say, A survives and wins, even though D's not mutually exclusive, D's going to be dismissed. Why? Because that's just what they decided. You know, uh, and trust me, I fought it and lost um, in, the, in an AM context many years ago. So, uh, so we've gotten to the, the point where we've de determined whether there's, there's mutually exclusive applications. I believe you'll have an opportunity to settle at that point. 
and that settlement could be engineering settlements where you go in and say, well, I'll, if you pull in a little bit, I'll pull in a little bit, and we both can get granted. Uh, or the other one, or the other one is say, I'll give you your money back if you dismiss your application. You can't make a profit, but you can get your money back if you, if you dismiss an application for that. Or you can pay someone, you can reimburse their expenses if, you, uh, if, if they're willing to dismiss their application in return for uh, those expenses. Again, for-profit settlements in this context are not allowed. Okay, so we've gone through that. Let's say there's no settlements, and we get to the next stage, which is to compare the applications. And I won't. I, I, one of the things you have there that I've passed around is a is a 12-page uh, public notice from the FCC. I wrote one up before they came up with this, but quite frankly, there's since they're the authentic. There's there's the people that are going to be making the decisions. We thought we'd go with the. Uh, the FCC's proposal. This does not cover every single thing that you could think of, uh, but that's why you, you have lawyers to deal with those things that fall in between the cracks. If you're going to be thinking about filing for w something during this window, you want to look at this memo, and because uh, it, it ex explains, I'm going over fairly quickly now. Hopefully, maybe maybe not quickly enough, but but going over fairly quickly uh, about what happens now. Let's get back into how the comparative process goes. The first thing that's going to happen is some engineering comparisons are going to occur. One probably will not apply. That is what is called first oral service. You'd have to be in a pretty remote area to be the ver that you would be providing the first radio service of any kind to a particular area. If you are, you win. You go to the head of the class, you got it. And that's, pro but that's more than likely not going to happen. Uh, but if your engineer tells you that you're, you're serving what's called a white area, meaning a service that has no other radio service, commercial, non-commercial, AM, FM, whatever, if they don't have any other service, you win. The next priority is tribal uh, priorities. Um, which I won't spend any time on uh, unless some, and if someone here is from a, an Indian tribe and you want to talk to me, we'll talk afterwards and we can go through that. Then the next comparison is, is whether you're providing uh, a first or second non-commercial service to a particular area of population. Now this will come up. Uh, my good friend uh, Bob Moore, who's a consulting engineer for many of you or for many things, is, is a wizard at finding um, areas that have that that the proposal would provide a first or second uh, non-commercial service within the station's 60 dBU con uh, yeah, 60 dBU contour. Uh, you count up the the area and that the, the area and population that is going to be receiving a first or second service. If it's more than 2,000 people, then uh, then you get a potential advantage. Um, it, it gets complicated after that. I'll refer you to the memo. Uh, first service is better than second service, uh, but, but uh, it gets, like I say, it gets complicated and you have to count up the people that are there. Let's assume that that, that doesn't decide the case, and most of the time it won't decide the case. And then we go to the, the comparative points. The, the First, uh, the largest comparative points, three points. A total of seven points are available, right? The first three points are for being local, okay? So it, it, being local, it means that you, it, it, within the close proximity of your commun proposed community of license, that you either have your headquarters, a campus, or 75% of your board members reside in the vicinity of that location. And that the organization that has, uh, is applying for the uh, uh, station has been in existence for at least two years. And we have to demonstrate that it's been in existence for two years, and we have to demonstrate that it's been local. And we also have to pledge that it's going to remain local. So if you do those things, if you, got, you get the three points for localism. The next uh, points are for diversity of ownership. And that means that if your 70 dBU contour does not overlap the 70 dBU contour of any other station with which 
uh, you or a member of your governing body is affiliated, you get two points for that. In other words, if you're, if you're new to this particular area, you get two points for that. Uh, if you don't, you know, if you're overlapping your existing uh, facility uh, or a non-fill-in translator, I won't go into the, we can go into those definitions down the line if you want to, um, uh, then you don't get the points. Uh, then the, the, there, there's also a, a, a alternative to that diversity uh, points called statewide uh, uh, network. Uh, unless you have many campuses or, or uh, across a state, uh, that's not going to come into play for you. That's really, to, that applies to people like Washington State University, which has campuses all over the state of Washington, um, and, and, uh, and might want to put in uh, a, a station in various locations. It's really aimed at the, uh, at the fundamentally the big colleges. And it's an alternative. You can't get both. You can either get diversity of ownership or you can get statewide network. You can't get both. So at that point, we've covered five points. Then the last two points is for who's going to provide the biggest service. Uh, if you provide more service than any of your competitors, you provide 10% more area and population than any of your competitors, you get one point. If you provide 25% more uh, uh, service to 25% more area and population than your other uh, competitors, then you get two points. There's only going to be one person in a group or one applicant in a group that's going to get those points. And, uh, and that's the, if at the, end of the, at the end of that process, uh, if you're tied, we go into tiebreaker points. And I'll do it pretty quickly because it gets complex. Uh, the f first tiebreaker is how many other stations do you already have? The person with the fewest stations wins. How many, uh, if, if that's tied, you know, let's say you both have zero stations right now, how many applications do you have pending in the window? Counting the, including the application here, the person with the fewest number of applications wins. If you're still, if you're still tied at that point, it, it, the third tiebreaker uh, goes into uh, whether you applied the last time around, lost, remain in existence, and still don't have a broadcast station. If that's the case, if you lost the last time around, you don't have a broadcast station and you're still in existence, <clears throat> you win that tiebreaker and that may be enough to, for you to win. At the end of that, if it's still tied, we go into what's uh, the, the, everybody will have an opportunity to negotiate again. And then if we don't, you can't come up to a settlement, they come into mandatory time sharing, which I'm not going to go into here because it is uh, complex. And, and hopefully we don't ever get to that point. So that, that is uh, in about, I think about 20 minutes, was about what uh, that, that underwriting uh, process is about. So. Okay, so let's just, we'll leave this topic. Do you have a question on just filing? Um, and Bill wants you to know Bob Moore is not here. Bob Moore is pretty much our go-to engineer. And like Myrtle Beach, I can't get a full power. He just said, no, can't. So the great thing about Bob, he'll immediately tell you what's open and what's not open, and if it's doable. So, um, Tom, you have it. Yeah, two questions. I'm curious, and I know there are a lot of factors, but what percentage of applications uh, end up being competitive. That's number one. And the second question, the mileage of the uh, headquarters and board, how many miles from the area? And is it the fringe, uh, the closest fringe area of, that you're covering, or how, how's that measured? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a hard uh, number, and I was, yeah, you might have noticed I was trying to finesse that because I was, uh, I could not remember it off the top of my head. I believe it's, uh, and I'm looking at it, it's 25 miles. 25 miles from the proposed, uh, uh, from the reference coordinates of the proposed community of license as opposed to the transmitter site. So you have to choose a community of license. And uh, you, there, there, there's, believe it or not, there in the U.S. Uh, pu publication, I think it's done by the, uh, 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 National Geographic Survey, uh, there is what is called a reference point for nearly every community in the country. And that's the starting point that you use. It's typically, uh, typically the main post office, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. 
So that is a factor that, uh, that your engineer will have access to what the reference point is, and that it's got to be within that 25 miles of that location. And that's an exact thing. I mean, if you're at 24.95 miles, you know, hopefully you're not splitting the building right over the line. That, that gets complicated. Yeah, we consider the lobby the headquarters. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but so that's, that's the 25-mile that's the, uh, limit. Matt, um, the last two times we've had a filing window open uh, where people could could file for 107.9 in NLA, I've had to defend our territory. Right. Should I be looking to do that for, we have a San Diego station that falls in this range, KSDW. Should I be looking to defend it during this time again? Yes. Okay, I'll gear up yeah, for that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, but, but I will say, unlike translators, uh, this is not, uh, tr you know, translators are secondary services, and they're, they're uh, if they cause any interference, even if they're fully rule compliant, you, you can, as a full power station, you can bump them off, right? With, with these stations, if they are rule compliant, then you, you do, and they cause interference to your fringe, you, you're not, you don't have that same power. You don't have that same protection. You, but you have to make sure that in fact they are rule compliant and that you, uh, and, and frankly once they go on the air that they're operating in compliance with their rules. So there's, that's, that's one of the areas that you're going to go in. I'm going to, uh, I'll get to you right where I said, uh, I was going to get the Tom's first question. Can't tell you. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I would guess it was about 30% were non amaxed and the rest, the other 70 were amaxed. I'd say of that 70%, half settled, and then the other half um, went to actual decision. Deci the problem with decisions typically would, would taken about two years to get, come out, and some complicated ones took a lot longer than that. Okay, Bill? 107.9 is a commercial frequency, so I missed why he would need to be worried. Probably a translator, I, I suspect. But this is a full power or, NCE window, right? So I don't. Why would that apply to him? Oh, your other one. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that point. Uh, okay. Tom, we applied seven uh, applications in 2007. We got one that was not MXed. And then we negotiated for two other ones, and we wound up losing the other four. So that might give you some approximate idea. Yeah, yeah we were MXed too. And it was um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and they didn't even know they filed. <laughs> Seriously, we went to the, the head guy at the chamber and said, did you know you filed? He goes, no. I said, do you really want a station? He said, no. So would you sign this paper from you, from, from the lawyer? Okay. And they dropped out, and we won. So you never know. Who right. is filing what? I, I make that point. Right. There's a, we do a lot of investigation. Well, investigation, checking uh, after people filed. I think that was my old partner, Harry Martin, who, by the way, just uh, for any of you that knew Harry, he's doing well. He just came back from uh, a, uh, a, his uh, annual three-day bike trip with a bunch of other uh, retired, now retired FCC lawyers, and uh, he's doing very well. He cashed all my checks. <laughs> we would do that. You know. I have a quick question. My uh, wife here manages... WRDJ in Florida, that's low power. And Bob Moore has been encouraging us to apply for a full power non-com station. So would that cause any conflict with our low power? Or? I'm really glad you brought that up because in fact, as, as you may know, under the, under the rules, a low power station licensee cannot have any other stations. But a low power is allowed to file for the new full power station, and it makes what's called a contingent divestiture pledge. So uh, it goes in and says, if we get the full power, we will either surrender the low power license or assign it to another entity. And and that that you don't have to do that until you're ready that you've won the full power, you've built the full power, and you're ready to go on the air, and then you can either divest the low power uh, station or or um, or turn in the license. 
depending on what you want to do. When I say divest, that you would give, uh, convey that station to another nonprofit entity that would qualify for a low power license. You can't, have, you can't have them both, though. You have one. <clears throat> okay. Last on full power filing. Okay. And again, we'll give you Bob Moore's email. Most of you guys have Bob Moore's email in front of them. Um, my, my question is, you said in the beginning that now's the time to start doing this. Like, like now? Like I mean, like, it, it, you know, maybe 1030. 1030. You, know, oh, yeah. you, so know, yeah, you really do need to get started on it right away. Can we start the process and then, because like I'm not the senior pastor. Right. But my senior pastor has said he wants to go full power. So in that process of, of doing that, they got to take it to people and say, okay, let's do this. So can I file everything and get it moving? And then from that point, if he's like, let's wait, you know, well, what's the, what's the, I guess the cost and the repercussions of doing all of that. Okay, the engineer is going to cost you some money. You know, uh, the engineer is going to want some some fee. I mean, uh, whether it's Bob Moore or someone else, yeah, they're Bob, going to want some. Bob's gotten with me and he showed right. me the maps and says, yeah, he said there's places open. Then you should, then you should uh, nail down, a, a uh, the next step is to nail down a specific transmitter site transmitter and have, site. have Bob start doing the engineering. Okay. And, uh, but I will say, uh, if you're going to go for it, go during this window because we don't know. Uh, I, I can guarantee you that I will have been retired by the time the, the next window is open because it's been many years in between windows. This so is probably it. For yeah, a at least for, for now. Okay, let's leave the topic of uh, filing window and let's go into some of our Matt questions that you got. Sure. Okay. Uh, so the other ones is interference by other stations. And it, it, it kind of meant one of the, the net, that was one of the questions I was And it sort of depends. Isn't that a lawyer's? Uh, it depends. You know, it depends on where the, in, uh, the, in, the interference is coming. If the interference is coming from a translator, there's a, there is now a mechanism that we follow when, it, when a translator interference is involved. It, I won't try to replicate everything that's involved, but it's, it's pretty set and dry. You, you, you gather from uh, people that are getting, your listeners that are getting interference, you gather from them a statement, includes information about who they are, where they get the interference. It does have to identify their phone number and such, and you, uh, you gather that up, and depending on how big your service area is, it determines how many uh, complaints you have to have. The minimum number of six, uh, I think the maximum number uh, for even a big station is 25. You, you put those together. You, uh, you, before you file the complaint, you have to talk to the, uh, the translator that's causing you interference and see if you can negotiate something. If they won't negotiate, uh, if, you've ne if you've negotiated in good faith and it hasn't been successful, then you file your complaint. The commission deals with it. The translator responds and all, we're off to the races. I'm not going to say it's quick. I'm not going to say it's, it's clean, but it's a lot quicker and it's a lot cleaner than it used to be when you had translator interference. So that's translators. If you have an interference from another full power station, it gets, and you're a full power station, it gets much more complicated because you have to dis discover what that problem is. Some of you, if, particularly if you're in the, uh, in, the warm parts of the country, you may experience at various times of the year ducting, where where an FM trans FM signals wind up going a lot further than they do at other times in the year, particularly in cooler times of the year. I have a client up in Minnesota that has to deal with ducting every year uh, with with another station that that and it goes as soon as the weather cools down, it goes away. Um, those are those are complicated issues. When you have those issues. You, you need to pull in your engineer, you need to pull in your lawyer to see if there's anything you can do and what the cause of that is. It could be that the, the, the other station is just operating illegally. And hopefully the first thing you do is say, hey, we've been getting a lot of, inter you go to them and say, we've been getting a lot of interference from you and we think you're operating it over power. And hopefully if the person is a, a good citizen, a good operator, they'll say, Thank you for bringing it to our attention, and we'll make the adjustment. Or even if they're not a good citizen and a good operator, that they know they've been caught, and we'll uh, and we'll back down. Uh, after that, it gets it's 
complicated. Uh, you, you have to you have to be able to. One of the difficult things, if there's interference, you have to, and you know that someone else is causing it by an illegal operation. The tough thing is proving that that's an illegal that they are overpowered. Um, the FCC does not give any credence to field measurements for AM stations. Or rather, they give lots of credence for AM stations. They don't give any credence to field measurements for FM stations. So um, on that general topic of interference, those are the type of issues you can. A big difference between translators. Translators are always secondary. They always have to give way to full power stations. So one of the, any, any questions in that area? Um, how many are LPFMs? Raise your hand. So LPFMs have no protection. I won't say they have no protection. They have protection from translators as well. From translators, but not full power. But not from full powers. Uh, although, uh, to some degree, to some degree, full powers don't have protection from them either. It, it, there's there's uh, there's rules that allow slight amount some interference in outside of the. Uh, principal community outside of the 70 dBU contour between full powers and LPFMs. Uh, the rule, I hate to, I know I keep overusing the word complicated, but it's complicated. So yeah. what dB is that? It, in the 40 or what? No, 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 no. Yeah, it, it's, it, it would be between, between the full powers 70 dBU contour and the full powers 60 dBU contour. Okay. Unless it's a class B in which it's a 54 or class B1, it's 57. Anybody so having any real problems right now with that? Somebody else encroaching? <laughs> we have a wonderful radio station nine months out of the year. <laughs> and three months, we live in Myrtle Beach where there is humidity and it kills the station. There are times where we come in and I'm driving in and there's uh, the tower is 1.9 miles from, this, from the church and we can't get it because of atmospherics and then a station out of Raleigh right. that rides the wave all the way down to Myrtle Beach. It's like 160 miles away hits us. And it's just the reality of where we are. 53 watts at, on the tower. I don't have enough power to push right past that. So it's just something you have to, you have to deal with. So anybody right. else on that topic of interference? Bill, you... It, it could be. I'd love to. Because <laughs> I'm tired of hearing Michael Jackson on my station. Because I'm not programming him. <laughs> yeah. so, so the next topic we're, on our list is license renewals. Uh, how many of you have already gone through the license renewals? And how many yet to go? Okay. okay we're down to the, uh, uh, the last four radio windows, um, they, they just, as you, it, very basically, they, they've chopped up, they, the FCC a million years ago, chopped up the, the country into uh, uh, various geographic segments, and so that all license renewals are, are done over a three-year cycle. The reason it was a three-year cycle, it used to be uh, uh, you had to get a renewal every three years instead of every eight years. Uh, so when I first started, that's part of what I did was we always were doing renewals because we always had somebody that was uh, in the cycle. Now, of course, since we have eight years, uh, we have three years that we're doing them. We're down to the last four groups. We're finishing the Pacific Northwest on October uh, 1, and then we swing back uh, to, the, uh, to the Northeast. Uh, and I won't try to replicate them, but basically the, the far northeast is next, and then uh, Delaware and Pennsylvania, and then New York, New Jersey. Um, the, the key thing for any of the, for the folks that still have their renewal to go, if you're full power, get your public inspection file squared away. Make sure that you've got uh, you're not going to have to, uh, presumably, you're not going to have to worry about your political file. That's been the bane of the commercial broadcaster's existence. There's been hundreds of consent decrees because political files were not up to date. <clears throat> but what you're going to be concerned about is your quarterly issues programs list if you're a full power. And you want to make sure that those are squared away, that you've got all of them there, that they go back, because we've had a lot of people that had, didn't realize this, they have to go back to this beginning of your license term. Uh, whether that, if that was 
earlier than 2014. Uh, well, it wouldn't be earlier than 2014. That's the latest it could have been because that would have been the last renewal. If you got your station after 2014, it has to go from the when you, time you got the station. Not from when they started online public files in March of 2018. You have to go back to the start of it. You have to upload all of those, those issues programs lists. That's, that's where person after person after person gets in trouble. You also need to make sure that you've covered your uh, uh, ownership reports because right now uh, ownership reports are a cause celeb with the FCC. They are really focusing on it. I've had clients that their renewals have been hung up because they, uh, they were late in filing their ownership reports. So it's important to get that, uh, get that taken care of. As you go, the, go ahead. No, I mean, I, yeah, that, that, that was basically the thing, uh, the, the renewal process uh, can, uh, uh, goes that you, you file. <laughs> Another mistake is it's not, you don't file when your license expires. You file four months before your license expires. And if you file late, you're going to get a fine. Uh, and depending, it depends on how late you are. Actually, they haven't been fining people if they file, uh, file up to 30 days late. But if you're later than 30 days, you're going to get a fine. So, uh, and, but I'll ha be happy to take your w question. Pirates? Right. Well, pirates, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, we, we lost uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, who, uh, who was the captain of the uh, pirate uh, uh, brigade to go after pirates. He was, he was really committed to that, and he really did a lot of work. And, he, and they still are doing work to do that. The New York Association of Broadcasters is, is vigorously pursuing pirates and they're vigorously pushing the, uh, the FCC staff, particularly in New York, uh, New York City, to go after pirates. It's, uh, as you may know, it's, it's whack-a-mole. You, you, you shut down a pirate on 88-1, uh, and uh, they'll show up at, at, uh, at, at 107.9. Uh, they're, they're all over the place. One of the things that the FCC is doing is they are going after landowners. And they figured that the landowners are, are going to be sensitive that, uh, because they're, they, they don't want a federal uh, case, uh, literally a federal case brought against them for having a pirate or uh, basically aiding and abetting a pirate or permitting a pirate to be on their land. So the FCC will go after the landowners, tell them that there's a pirate there, and let the landowners go ahead and, and push to, uh, to get rid of the pirate. So that's, uh, a, but it is a constant, it is a constant battle. So uh, let me move on to the, uh, the, the next one we've, uh, which is uh, keeping legal with spots, in other words, underwriting. Uh, I've uh, circulated here uh, a, our, our memo, uh, our standard memo regarding uh, underwriting and some other fundraising uh, issues that come up. Um, I'm not going to go through the memo point, uh, the memo point by point. I will say that, that um, unfortunately, the stations that, that get hit most often are the non-NPR stations, although I do know some NPR stations that have been dinged too. Uh, client, uh, a client of mine got thumped pretty good. Uh, so the key thing is, is that uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you is, is that you have to be a, a pay attention to qualitative language. It, the, the objective from the FCC's perspective of underwriting announcements is to recognize and acknowledge and identify the, uh, the underwriter, not to promote the underwriter. While you're allowed to use the underwriter's slogan, the slogan itself can't be promotional. Now, frequently I say if it's on the borderline, if a slogan's it's a borderline question whether the slogan's promotional or not promotional. The fact that it's a well-used slogan that they use frequently may help us convince the FCC, if we're ever challenged, that that's a permissible use. The FCC also has what's called the Xavier Doctrine. It's based on a case involving Xavier University. 
in which the, the commission said that if a, the broadcaster has made a good faith determination that the spot doesn't cross the line and is not promotional, the FCC is supposed to recognize and acknowledge that good faith determination. The problem with that rule, of course, is that if they, don't, if they disagree with you, they just say, well, that wasn't done in good faith, and, and you, uh, you have to deal with it. Um, there are, have been any number of cases that come up. It, uh, the cases come up on underwriting in two different places, both in the Media Bureau, specifically the Audio Division, and in the Enforcement Bureau. Um, the, 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 the rate card is about 1000 bucks per, per bad spot. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're at. The most likely place that you're going to get a complaint is from a commercial competitor. The FCC is not typically going out there and checking things themselves uh, unless you've somehow become a cause celeb for the FCC. Uh, there was a station in uh, California that did become a cause celeb for the FCC where they went after them many, many times, eventually reaching a six-figure consent decree. Um, uh, but none of you, none of you are, uh, I trust, are in that position. When you are in doubt, check with your attorney. Um, I can tell you that I, I probably do five, eh, that's an overstatement, three underwriting spots a week that people call me. And I usually can do it in because I've been doing this for a long time. I'm not both, just boasting about myself. Most attorneys that have been in this business for a while can do this at the same time. Just, have, just, just run it by them. Uh, one, there, there, you may find that there's particular uh, precedent out there that tells, that answers the question, and other times we have to just make a judgment on the basis of the precedent that does exist and the knowledge we have about the rules. I will say a couple of things. Uh, the longer it is, the more likely the FCC is going to find it to be promotional. I have to say, even though it's not written anywhere, the more production values it has with it, the more suspicious the FCC is going to be about it. But there's no rule. There's no. There's no rule that says you can't use production values uh, and music, etc. There's nothing that says that. But the longer it is, the more likely they're going to find it to be promotional. If you'll, you'll find in the memo uh, the various classifications there, but one of the ones to stay away with is price information. And price information is couldn't be more broad. Discount is price information. Free is price information. Guarantee is price information. Um, uh, all of that stuff, uh, interest rates, financing available are all considered price information. So if, if it involves money, be cautious. Um, and like I say, as you're going through it, feel free to use that. Uh, we do, if, if any of you are lawyers, let me know and I'll send you the, the version we have of that that has all the citations in it. So that we use internally. So this is the most questioned question that we all get on the thread, and Bill's going to say something. The easiest thing to remember, if it's another nonprofit organization, that's easy. If it's for, if they are a business or for profit, then you have to be careful. Exactly. And, and just send it, just send them an email and say, what do you think of this? Right. But if it's nonprofit, do whatever. Exactly. Matter. You can do. You, you can. You can run a straight-out commercial for a nonprofit. You know. You can. You can. You can give price, call to action. You can tell. Do anything if it's a nonprofit, and it doesn't have to be a 501c3 nonprofit. It just has to be a nonprofit. Now, let me hit two other quick things. Hold on, they don't come up very. Uh, you know, I've had people take that logic that. Gee, nonprofit, that means a political campaign is a nonprofit. I can run spots for them. Yeah. Au contraire. Yeah. There is a specific uh, uh, prohibition against running uh, spots for political candidates. It's in Section 399B of the Communications Act. There's also a, another provision that says you cannot sec accept remuneration to express the view. Uh, of, a, uh, of any person on a matter of, national, or of public interest or importance. Now, could you think of a more broad statement than public interest or importance? Um, they, there, there's not been many decisions in that 
we, didn't, we haven't seen any reported cases for years, and even the reported cases they, we saw there were, were really more political candidate spots. Uh, if it comes up, uh, now you are free, of course, to express your uh, viewpoints that, you, that people have. You just can't accept money for someone putting, getting on the air and expressing their viewpoint on a matter of public interest or importance, at least in underwriting. And I Bill. just want to add to that, guys. As a pastor, chief engineer, general manager, chief cook, bottle washer, and I take the trash out too, um, you don't need the money. You, you just don't need the money. God will provide for your needs. And what we've been doing, I cut all my spots back to 29 seconds if it's a sponsorship spot because someone said if it goes over 30, so okay, I'm going to keep it at 29. And we've had great success putting scriptures in there. Like we, we have a dentist and uh, they'll read a clip from C.S. Lewis and then uh, they'll say this, uh, this, was, this thought was brought to you by Dr. Stephen Kang who is a great supporter of Christian radio. I'll tell you, most people when they get up in the morning, they don't need an electrician. But everybody in the world needs a dentist and a surprisingly large percentage of people are unhappy with their dentist. And this guy on our station, he's swamped with business. I mean, he is, he is such a happy camper because so many Christians are coming to him. I, I tell you, put the local dentist, if he's a believer, at the top of your list. And I learned something from Tom Keller. You put at the end of the spot, Hope FM is thankful to Dr. Stephen Kang for helping to bring great Christian radio to this area. So that way, as Tom said at a previous radio conference, Every time that sponsor hears the ad, he's being reminded that he's helping to do that. But if it's questionable, yes, you can send Harry, an e or I'm sorry, you can send Matt an email. But if it's questionable, you can also just not, you just don't do it. You don't need it. Do something else. Uh, you know, cut them back. And if they don't like your rules, you know, move, move on to someone else. God's not going to let any of us go broke. We know that. I just would want to encourage you to. Trust in him for the finances and not sweat it. And Tom will give you some great tips on how to word your spot. And t Tom's good. So, <laughs> so we have a restaurant, and on uh, and we say where you can get uh, uh, pork patties, uh, hamburgers, but we don't say great hamburgers. Is we go through a list. It, it, it's, is that promotional? Or is well, that no, that's fine, uh, except you can't, uh, there, there, there is one structure that you can't have a, quote, menu. And uh, uh, we've, we've debated many times about what constitutes menu. menu. It used to be, we, our, our internal advice was seven. Uh, then, then a decision came out and, and uh, somebody got dinged for five. We said, okay, it's got to be less than five. Then somebody got, came out and got dinged for four. So what we say is three. <laughs> Don't mention more than three different products or services uh, in one spot. But uh, there, I, I got to tell you, sometimes there are something. There actually is a decision that says home style meals is not promotional. Okay. I would have thought it would be promotional, but the the defense was no. That identified the type of product they were selling, as opposed to what restaurant style meals. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Lousy meals. <laughs> Actually, that would be a qualitative aspect, and I would, I wouldn't go with that. So, uh, uh, Robert's got a point, and I like how they do their um, sponsorship. Just give a quick. Yeah, um, what we do is um, we'll say programming on the bridge is sponsored by John's Mechanic, servicing domestic and foreign cars. Online, John.com, seven one four blah 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 blah, and then I say at the end. Um, you know, the bridge thinks John's mechanic for helping us spread the gospel. That's it. That's well, all. It, that's that's all of them do that. Uh, but I do have a question. Is a sure. qualitative um, statement saying they've been around for 30 years or they're a mom and pa shop? What is that? The interesting thing, a ma, you put a, they've been around for 30 years is permissible. They're the oldest in the community is not. Uh, there's actually rulings on that. They're a mom and pop shop would probably be qualitative. Okay. You about, could say operated by Mr. and Mrs. DeLuca, and that would be okay. 
and specializing in? Probably OK. okay. One of the ones that's a little fuzzy for us sometimes is when a church is having, so they're a nonprofit, they're having a concert with a music group that is for profit. Can we uh, promote that concert? Who's the producer? That's what it boils down to. If, if the church is the one, and I, th there's not actual FCC decisions that use this phrase, but who has the risk of loss? If the church is just providing the hall and, and such, then, then the normal uh, commercial restrictions apply. If the church is the producer, and the church is taking the church is paying for the act, paying for the uh, is taking the risk that it's successful or not. They can do whatever they. Then you can have the full spot. It's it's it kind of boils down to who's really the sponsor. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, Rich Ader, KJC. Uh, if you run more than one uh, underwrite sponsored uh, spot go ahead spot. we call them spots yeah uh, back to back or like sure two or three could you then be on the edge of becoming descriptive no no it's not it's not a problem uh, the as you may know the NPR stations run spot blocks that now run about a minute and a minute 15 they'll they'll put several of them together so no that's it's okay oh the same sponsor Oh, the same sponsor? No, then that's a problem. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about spot blocks. Yeah, I'd, I'd be cautious of running back to back because those are going to consi be considered one spot. And yeah, Mark Ramirez of the Lamp. Um, I don't know who to ask, but what is what can I charge or what can I charge? Oh well, the, whatever you want. And indeed, one of the things that has been out there is you're going to have a rate card. Uh, they, they, the, the FCC and in informal decisions has said, sure, you can have a rate card that says, gee, uh, if uh, you pay $500, you get, you know, 50, uh, 50, uh, 50 mentions. And uh, the, the FCC there's said there's no problem with that. And uh, what it is, that's what the market will bear. Uh, you might talk to your NPR uh, uh, colleagues because they uh, they work pretty hard on trying to figure out what the uh, what their spot rates are. Rick Bell, KDBW, Montrose, Colorado, LPFM. Okay. Fundraising. Okay. How do we handle if the church? Let, let's say we are in need of a specific. Uh, application, equipment, whatever, and we're holding a fundraiser towards that end. How do we promote that, or do we promote that on air? And and it's and the money's going to the station. Correct. You pretty you have you have a free hand, pretty much a free hand. If it's to raise money for the station, you pretty much have a free hand. Good to hear. Okay. I thought you were going to go through the complicated one with third-party fundraising. Uh, if you want to raise, if you want to interrupt programming, if you want to do a marathon for, uh, and uh, obviously you can do marathons for your own station. That's the, the long been respected, long been allowed. You, you can now, if you chose to do so, do marathons for third parties. There are restrictions on it about how much time you can uh, spend uh, and I think it's 1% of your annual on-air hours uh, that, that you can use uh, to raise, uh, uh, raise money for a third party. Uh, that, that, in a strange political compromise, that rule is not available to CPB-funded uh, stations, but it is available to, to uh, stations such as yours if you want to raise money for, uh, for a third party. If you go before you go into that, you might want to check with your lawyer or or check the rule because there's relatively specific requirements related to it, including posting certain information in your public inspection file. Tom. Yeah. Question. So Charles Stanley, on our on our air, advertises for a trip to Israel. It's through Inspired Travel. So they're they're the ones at risk. Inspired Travel, but we're we have them and they're promoting their trips to Israel. How does that? 
we're okay. saying all. So let me make sure I, so who, who is, who's the promotion, who's the promoter? Charles Stanley. They're, they're, uh, if it's Charles Stanley and you have to, uh, if they're, they're the promoter. Well, they, no, well, the trip is being run through Inspired Travel. They're the ones that are the beneficiaries. And, and, uh, and, and they're uh, a for-profit. Inspired is a for-profit. A for-profit. Then you have to follow all the same restrictions wow. you would have for any other commercial thing. You can describe what the product is. You can describe where they're going. You can describe the, you can describe the date that you're, they're going. You cannot describe their, the money. Yeah. If, if uh, the, more, the, the one that I encounter that gets more difficult is where the station is sponsoring a cruise or a trip. Those you have to, again, the sta if the station's gonna do that and they're gonna provide all the information, then the station has to be the one that nominally is taking the risk of failure. In other words, that they're, real, that they're just contracting with the third party to do it. It's really the station's trip. It gets to be, when you, if you're going in that direction, definitely seek ad the advice of your lawyer before you dive into it. But they do speak of quality. That's okay. that is over the that's over the top. You can't mention quality. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You, so you can't. What, what, you can't the, best, the best. This is the best, this is the best trip. Absolutely not. Okay. Unless unless your unless the station, a nonprofit, is the one that's the that's actually doing the trip, that's sponsoring the trip. And that's why some, some nonprofits, they sponsor trips, and what they do is they're taking the risk that the cabins are not sold. But of course, what they do is they buy just a very few number of cabins, and then if they get more people, they add another one, and they add another one, and they add another one. But the sponsor in that case is the station. You gotta, you gotta free your hand there. If it's being run by, even though you might be affiliated with it or you're associated with it, if it's being run by a for-profit agency, you have to follow all the normal for-profit restrictions. Go ahead, Bill. You know, it keeps coming back to the risk of loss. Who has the risk of loss? I don't, I really try hard to keep the Israel trips off the station because um, almost always the, the risk of loss is with the travel agency or whoever's doing it. And um, I'm just, you heard Harry say, or I'm sorry, I keep saying Harry. You heard Matt say you get $1,000 a ding. If you play Charles Stanley every day and they promote their Israel trip every day and somebody catches up with you, multiply that by 1,000. I tell these people, you just can't do that on our air. There are ways around it. Caleb rents out, and I'm not supposed to say that here, but they just rent out a whole cruise ship. They just buy the whole cruise, every cabin. It's just a Caleb cruise. They pay for it, they own it, and now they have the total risk. If you buy books in your bookstore and you own them, and then if you don't sell them, you lose the money, then you can promote that. Uh, if you all want to get together and rent out a cruise ship, maybe we can have a Calvary Chapel radio station cruise. We'll do it better than Caleb, and we'll take the risk. And we'll, invite, we'll have a legal seminar on board while we're, while we're doing it. <laughs> So when I went to Israel a couple... I'm all for it. I'm, count me in. <laughs> so when I went to Israel a couple of years ago, we promoted it as Calvary Chapel Myrtle Beach. So right. we were the one that was taking the hit, and then that's what we promoted on our station. It was not from the travel company, not even mentioning the travel company. Right. It was all on the church and taking that hit. So, I mean, that's why we don't have very many national programs on there. But... Um, they do have, Robert, I'm trying to remember, do the, the national programs can take those, those spots out, can they not? They have two different, yeah, but it, like in their folder, when you go into FTP, sometimes you'll get a national folder and then another folder and that doesn't have those in there. Yeah, a local, that's right. So you should ask that of that ministry if you're choosing to carry that ministry. Say, we don't want the national um, spots on there. We want the local spots. Yeah. And it was just pointed out by Rob Taylor, who texted me, that many of these programs have non-com versions. So if, you, if there's a non-com version, you want that. But the next thing is, 
do they really understand what non-conversion means? Because I have run into people who think it's a non-conversion, but they really don't know what that means. And that's on you, because it's your license. Yeah, yeah. One. Um, Matt, do the rules on that change if that production house or that ministry is not providing any uh, support? You know, you're running their programs and you're not asking any money from them. Like for example, Tom, uh, if he's not charging for Charles Stanley to be on the air. Okay, so you're, let me make sure I understand. The program that you're getting is running spots, for the lack of a better term, for a cruise, but you're not getting anything for it. Well, I, unfortunately, in the FCC's mind, you are getting something for it. You're getting the program. And there's long established precedent that says the program itself is consideration. So, and all of these, all of these things are driven on whether you're receiving consideration. So, so the program is value in itself. The program that's is value it is. itself. And so therefore, it doesn't excuse us from that same restriction. Yes. Has that ever come up to the FCC, that specific issue that we're talking about? Cruises, trips to Israel, has that come up? I, I've been dealing with it one way or another for 30 years. Real? Okay, so, and your, and your point then is somebody commercial, a commercial station is going to hear our non-com station and they're going to go, hey, that's not fair, and they're going to be the ones to complain. Right. The, the most likely person to ever complain about underwriting is not, uh, is, is your commercial competitor, especially if you're really, you're, you're digging into their market. You know, uh, you, you, you will hear from them. Uh, or you, you may not hear from them. That's the problem is, is that they may choose to, uh, to file a complaint and you don't know about it until you get a letter of inquiry from the FCC, uh, which is, and by the way, if you get a letter of inquiry from the FCC, do not, I emphasize, do not try to, to homebrew it. Uh, do not try to, to do it yourself. Get an attorney. Uh, even if you're doing every, I, and I respect folks that do a lot of things on themselves, but if you get a letter of inquiry, get an attorney involved because, because uh, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, there's so many bad things that could happen if you, in, in responding to a, a notice of inquiry, if you don't do it right, especially if there's someone aggressive on the other side, if there's someone on the commercial side that's, that wants to do, wants something from, wants you to go away or, or, or something like that. Go ahead. So you keep saying get an attorney, get an attorney, get an attorney. Right. Not because I, I'm not pushing my, myself, but I'm, uh, you know. I'm. Um, so, and everybody like inside of our church, you know, I'm like, hey, do you got an attorney? And the response is always, uh, I, I do uh, investments, I do homes, we need a specific FCC guy. Now, does this all work through email? Does it all work Pretty through much. like Zoom? So we're never like, I'll see you once a year if I come to these things. Let me tell you, my oldest client, day I, I, I started um, this Friday will be my uh, 42nd anniversary of being an attorney. Uh, so I started October 1. Thank you very much. Uh, and the, 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 when I came in and, the, and my, my senior partner said, help this guy out, a guy named Mike Casey from, at that time, Johnston, South Carolina. Um, and he helped this guy out. And I went in and, you know, of course, I didn't know anything, but I tried the best. Mike is still my client, you know, although he just sold his last station. We have been friends uh, I've been his lawyer, he's been my client for all of those 42 years, and we have never met. Never met. In fact, we've never done a Zoom call together. We've, uh, uh, I've seen his picture on the website and he's seen mine on the website, but other than that, that's it. And I, and I consider him a, a close friend. So no, you don't, the, the attorneys do uh, almost never, sh I mean, <laughs> let me put it this way, if your attorney has to show up where you are, you're in real trouble. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last one, and then we're yep. going to take a break. Okay. This isn't really a question. It's, it's more of an endorsement uh, for your firm. Your firm handled 
my station, I had a daytime only AM station in the Pacific Northwest. I was within the major contour of the Clear Channel station of Seattle. And I don't mean Clear Channel by firm, I'm talking about on AM, you have these Clear Channel stations. It's an FCC type. Right. Uh, you negotiated with KOMO 1000 to allow us to interfere with them because where my transmitter was located in order to move the transmitter site to not interfere with them would have been putting the transmitter out in the ocean. And we got a letter that gave us an exemption, if you will, or they said, well, you guys are small enough. You're, it's <laughs> not a worry and, you know, we're not gonna bother the fish. So I wanna thank you for that. Sure. That was way back in 19, I want to say about maybe 82, 83, well, when that took place. And you guys did an outstanding job, and you were always there. Uh, you know, we could ignore you for a year or whatever, but then if we had a problem, you know, we called you up. And then, of course, once email came around, you know, send you an email. But uh, you folks have been right there in our corner, so to speak. I mean, being an FCC attorney, knowing the ins and outs more than what we could ever hope to do, so you covered our back, and it's much appreciated. We're happy to do it. We're happy to do it. Okay, so we're going to give you uh, 15 minutes coffee out.